All right, why don't we get started? It looks like we have enough people. Um, so hi everyone, welcome to the first CPC seminar of the spring 2021 semester. Um, my name is Jessica Sue, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and also a faculty fellow here at CPC. Um, before we get started, I'm just gonna make a couple of points about the format for today. So this is a webinar style Zoom and our speaker is gonna give her presentation. At the end is gonna take your questions. So you should see a little Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And you can enter your questions at any point. I will read them throughout the talk. And when we get to the Q&A portion, I will moderate and read your question out to our speaker. So today I'm really honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. Fenaba Otto. Fenaba just joined UNC as an Associate Professor of Public Policy. So this seminar is really a great opportunity for us to learn more about her research and also to welcome her to our community. Um, prior to joining UNC, she was an Associate Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She earned her PhD in Policy Analysis and Management from Cornell University. And she also has a BS in economics from Duke University. And now I have to do that obligatory joke where I say we're not gonna hold that against her. Um, and on a personal level, I am especially honored to introduce Fenaba today as part of the CPC series because we are not only colleagues, but also collaborators and friends. And I wanted to mention this because it was actually demography that brought us together. We both went to graduate school at Cornell, but we were in different departments. She was in the policy department and I was in the sociology department, um, but we didn't actually meet in Ithaca. We met for the first time in Detroit at the 2009 PAA conference. And a conversation over lunch there was the start of our friendship. And a few years later at another PAA conference, I think it was in San Francisco, um, we were hanging out after the panels and we decided that we should write a paper together so we hatched our plan to launch a collaboration and it has just been a wonderful experience. And I'm sharing this story because I think our friendship and our collaboration speaks to the power of this interdisciplinary perspective that we can take um, in population studies. And it also speaks to the vital role that organizations like the PAA and the CPC play in sparking these kinds of relationships and conversations. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit more about Fenaba. She researches the role of debt and in increasing wealth inequality in the United States. And she is a preeminent voice in the national conversation on student loan debt and how it reproduces and contributes to racial inequality. For example, um, her work is discussed by politicians and policymakers such as Elizabeth Warren. Um, and she was recently interviewed for NPR's Marketplace and um, this, in my mind, is achieving academic celebrity status. <laughs> so I know that we will be learning a lot from her today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Fenaba Otto. You can take it away. Thanks for that, Jessica. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here at UNC and to join you all this afternoon. Um, yes, Jessica and I love sharing the story of how we met uh, at in Detroit in the food court <laughs> uh, during the PAA meetings. Um, and it's been a wonderful friendship and a wonderful collaboration working with Jessica. So um, I'm very happy and excited to be here and to join you all this morning and to start off the CPC Spring Seminar Series. So I am gonna be talking this afternoon um, about my research program on racial disparities in student debt. Um, I should also say that I, you know, I consider myself a family researcher and an inequality scholar. And my work, as Jessica uh, touched upon, broadly speaking, explores the role of debt and wealth inequality on well-being and social mobility within our society. I have largely focused on communities of color and young adults, as well as older Black women. So, uh, you know, just to kind of give you an overview of where we're going today, um, I will start by providing a brief overview of the student debt crisis. I will then summarize my work on the relationship between familial wealth and education debt accumulation, um, racial disparities in debt trajectories, and the relationship between debt trajectories and the racial wealth gap in young adulthood. 
I will then conclude with a brief discussion that brings together some new work that I've been doing that explores the black middle class and higher education. So it is pretty well known, uh, hopefully, <laughs> with, in our society that student loan debt is high and rising. So this trend began around the early 2000s and has continued through the Great Recession and afterwards. According to the Federal Reserve Bank, approximately about 40 mil, 45 million borrowers owe over $1.7 trillion. So this has surpassed credit card and auto loan debt is, and is only second to mortgage debt on the household balance sheet. So what explains this rise? Well, more students have been going to college and are taking on loans to do so. And over the past 30 years or so, we see college tuition costs rising. Um, they've risen faster than inflation. And despite federal financial aid becoming more generous, state and institutional aid per student have been declining and shifting these costs to students and their families who have to turn to credit markets to make up the difference between family resources and these rising costs. So not only do we see more young adults taking on debt to attend college, but also the amount of debt that graduates are leaving with and those who are, are non-completers, those who don't have their degree has also been rising over time. So the average undergraduate borrower leaves college with approximately $29,000 in debt. Um, and in 2007, we see that graduates who finish from a nonprofit, public or private institution, their average student debt was around 28,000 or close to $29,000. And from for-profit institutions, it was higher. So close to 40, so just under $40,000. Um, but this also, um, uh, if we just you know work in averages, it kind of masks what's happening across the distributions, and we see that most borrowers, or about five percent, uh, fifty-five percent, hold less than about twenty thousand dollars worth of debt, um, and forty-three percent of the outstanding federal loan debt was held by about ten percent of borrowers who owe over eighty thousand dollars worth of debt. So we start to really kind of scrutinize. And, and get a little bit deeper into the numbers, we see variations across the distribution of who's holding the debt and how much they're holding. In fact, we see that those with the highest loan balances tend to be students who graduate and go on to graduate school. They also con constitute a small, smaller percentage of the loan population. We also um, have seen that those who struggle the most with repayment have less than $10,000 worth of debt and are more likely to have not completed their studies. This has led some people to argue that there may not necessarily be a student loan crisis, but really a student debt repayment crisis. So why is this? So if you can see in this chart, on the left, 56% of borrowers held less than 20% of debt, while 6% had over 100,000, so kind of mirroring the numbers I just talked about. And the US Department of Education reports that more than 8 million federal loan student borrowers, or close to 20%, are in default and have not made a payment in at least a year. So these um, were pre-COVID, so this is from last year's uh, figures. Um, however, you know, in the work that we've been doing, we would argue that it may not necessarily be a question of either or, is there a student debt crisis or is there a repayment crisis? But if we think about the different populations who are holding this debt, it may be that some of them are experiencing both of these crises, crises, crises. <laughs> So over that same period, we see increasing racial disparities in student loan debt, both in the proportion of households that carry loans, as well as the percentage of household financial debt portfolio that is composed, comprised of student loan debt. And while we see that both the uh, black and white household, uh, black and white households, uh, the rates for black and white households are both increasing, the rate for black households is significantly greater than whites and continues post recession. And we, um, this is stops in 2013, but those rates continued through the 2016 and 2019 survey and consumer finance data. At all levels of higher education, black students are more likely to borrow for their degrees. They're also more likely to take on debt for their degrees. So for example, black students compose 12% of all bachelor degree recipients um, in the 2015-2016 uh, academic year. 64% or almost two thirds had over $30,000 worth of debt and a third had over $40,000. We also see that default rates for student debt are stratified. Oops, this is, so this is, more this is showing that disproportionality of taking on more debt. Um, across the board and black, uh, black borrowers are more likely to be concentrated um, among the higher, uh, higher levels of student loan debt. 
Okay, so we also see that um, default rates are stratified by race. Um, more than a third of black borrowers ever defaulted on their loans compared with 20% of Latinx, 12% of white, and 6.5% of Asian borrowers. Default rates for black borrowers also exceed white borrowers independent of whether they completed their studies. So 10 years post-graduation, Black borrowers owed about 51% of their initial loan debt, and 21% have had some experience with non-payment, either in the form of, form of loan deferment or forbearance. So prior to this, um, uh, you know, so this, when we started this work, I should say, there was little uh, conversations around or that recognized that rising student loan debt may have been disproportionately impacting young adults of color, and especially Black youth. So we turn to, uh, you know, with my focus on the transition to adulthood period in the life course, I think it's critical um, in particular to think about when wealth accumulation um, and the timing of wealth, wealth accumulation occurs. So with young adulthood being a very critical point when, um, when, when individuals start to either add on to existing savings, so we'll talk about you know, intergenerational wealth gaps, but also um, may start to accumulate their own independent savings as well. So individuals in particular who can accumulate um, appreciating assets earlier are more likely to acquire more wealth. And young, young adulthood is therefore this critical moment in the life course, not just for or you know those conventional demographic transitions that occur, but also for wealth accumulation. And so this, I think, it bridges or provides a nice opportunity for us to think about you know um, the inequality of demography or, or demographic inequality, uh, the case of student loan debt. So um, much of my work has relied on data, uh, a sample data from the NLS or the National Longitudinal Study of Youth 1997 cohort. This is a, um, uh, a survey that consists of a nationally rep representative sample of young adults who were born between 1980 and 1984. They're sometimes characterized as older millennials, right? So um, they began interviewing the youth in 1997, and they were interviewed yearly through 2011, and then biennially um, through 2017. This data set is also um, great because they have comprehensive wealth data across the early and young adulthood period. They have these asset and debt modules that are repeated every five years starting at age 20. They have self-reported student debt data from all sources, including public and private. And the NLSY97 has linked their data sets to the integrated post-secondary education data system. So this, um, once you have access, it's restricted data, but once you have access, you're allowed um, to have information on respondents, um, location of the schools attended, the types of schools they attended, and even really, you know, great kind of rich information on post-secondary institutional characteristics, such as the average aid uh, to cost ratio, and if the institution was a for-profit. Oh, sorry. So in this first paper, we use NLSY sample data to center the role of racial wealth inequality in the student debt discussion. We show that family wealth is a particularly important resource that drives racial disparities in student debt or uh, educational loan debt accumulation. As the cost of college have become increasingly privatized, a family's ability to pay for college will increase with their wealth position. In this paper that was published in the Journal of Race and Social Problems, we use a sample of non-Latinx Black and non-Latinx White young adults who completed the over age 25 asset and debt module and ever reported um, some being enrolled in some post-secondary institution. We use this data to analyze racial differences in debt holdings and add in um, the um, the parental wealth, both secondary institutional characteristics, family contributions, and young adult characteristics to examine the extent to which these factors explain the differences in debt holdings. And we introduced interactions by, by race, uh, race, excuse me, race by parental wealth interactions to examine whether parental wealth may have different implications for debt for black and white young adults. So what do we see? Oops, this is information on what we do. We have regression models to model uh, log student loan debt. And again, I say we have all include all these additional controls um, to help explain what might be the relationship between um, debt holdings and wealth. So we see, you know, in aggregate what you might expect. 
because this negative relationship between parental wealth as wealth increases, the amount of debt on average that a young adult held by around age 25 was uh, uh, declined. More specifically, we find that for a given $10,000 worth in parental wealth, their young adult child will accumulate about 7.6% uh, less debt. When we disaggregated by race for white young adults, we see that the relationship holds, you know, that we saw in the previous slide. Whereas for black youth, at the most basic level, wealth was not associated with the amount of debt their children accumulated. In fact, we find that black young adults from wealthier families are more indebted than their white peers and relative uh, to black young adults from less wealthy families. We find that the racial disparities in student debt is highest among the wealthiest families. So, if we think about this, the wealth distributions are so incredibly disparate that Black parents only compose about 3.2% of the top wealth quintile in our data set. And this was defined as holding a net worth of at least $191,000. Um, Feneva? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know that um, we're getting some feedback, I think maybe from the papers that you're um, doing that's just interfering with the microphone. Okay, thank you. I will move that. Thanks. Um, so this work, we believe, is important because it highlights the fact that Black families are less able to use their wealth to protect, to protect their children from a student debt burden. It is also suggestive that patterns of racial wealth inequality are being replicated by student debt accumulation. So we take up this question in our next paper that extends the cross-sectional analysis. Um, and exploit the panel nature of the NLSY 97 to examine racial differences in debt trajectories across young adulthood. So not only does the racial wealth gap reflect historical legacies of government policies that have disadvantaged wealth building and or extracted wealth from black communities, but also that racial disparities in debt accrual and repayment reflect processes of racialized economic hardship and discrimination that accumulate across the life course for recent and, and are manifesting in recent cohorts of young adults. Um, so specifically that both existing and historical processes of racial stratification and exclusion compound across the, across the life course to create inequalities in debt and debt burden is what we're gonna argue. So in addition to family resources, um, including parental wealth and inter intergener intergenerational wealth, we pinpoint two additional domains to explain how debt disparities exist prior to college enrollment, persist during the post-secondary schooling years, and factors upon school leaving that contribute to ongoing disparities in debt repayment rates. For example, we know that Black young adults are, all, are often funneled toward predatory for-profit institutions or are more likely to attend underfunded schools, which are associated with higher levels of debt accumulation. Black youth are also more likely to have private loans or hold private loan debt, um, which carry high and variable interest rates and have high fees for deferment or forbearance. Indeed, some have even argued that the student loan market is not the student loan market is not unlike the mortgage market, where black um, black borrowers lack access to fair credit and are disproportionately steered towards predatory high interest loans that are difficult to repay. As young adults, Black youth also experience hardship and discrimination in the labor market that makes debt more burdensome to repay. Black college graduates are more likely to be unemployed or underemployed, and um, Black-white disparities in earnings and employment mean that Black youth may have more difficulty paying down student debt at the same rate as white youth after leaving college. So our first set of research questions, oops, that's, this, that's the last part. Okay, so again, we're going to draw from NLS 97, and we're going to follow um, our young adults upon entry or enrollment into their first post-secondary institution until the end of the study period, and we're restricting them to, in, uh, to respondents who are ever enrolled in post-secondary education. Um, our first set of research questions consisted of how do racial disparities and debt change across the early, early adult life course? And then to what extent do inequalities in our three domains, so that being family background, post-secondary educational institutional characteristics, and young adult, and the third domain, which is the young adult social and economic roles or status, explain differences in the debt trajectories that we see. We use hierarchical linear growth curve models, um, which allow us to compute several features of debt accumulation over time, including 
racial disparities in student debt at baseline, um, how the trajectories vary over time as a a vary as over time as a function of uh, race, and then the extent to which these racial differences in debt trajectories are explained by our three domains. So consistent with prior studies, we find baseline, baseline racial differences are large and significant. Um, we, in, our, in our sample data, black young adults held about close to 55% more debt than white young adults. And then um, this is controlling for those family background um, and young adult characteristics. We find that the student loan debt disparity increased over the course of the study period and that the black white disparity in debt grew by about 7.2% annually. That is, you know, to, or alternatively stated, that black young adults start their young adult careers with more debt than, their, than white young adults and the disparity is growing wider over time. Uh, we see the data that black young adults pay down their debt at a rate of uh, close to 2%, 2 um, compared with 9.5% rate for the white young adults in our sample. We are also able to explain about 50% of the difference in the debt disparity based on our observable characteristics. Um, more specifically, family background characteristics, so parental education, parental net worth, um, household income, mediate a large portion of the racial wealth differences at debt at baseline, but play only a small role in explaining the growth in the trajectory of disparity over time. So that was the first part of that paper. And then the second part of the paper takes up this question about whether or not student debt may be a new mechanism uh, by which racial, social, and economic inequalities are being produced and now reproduced um, across generations. So not only are Black young adults uh, more likely to come from families with less wealth, but they are also accumulate more debt on average. So if Black young adults are paying down their debt when those without debt are purchasing homes, kind of like what I referenced earlier about the timing of wealth accumulation, the ability to accumulate savings, um, then it's highly unlikely that they will be able to catch up or even surpass, um, surpass those who um, did not have that same or start with that same debt burden. So we ended up using for this piece, uh, for this part, excuse me, uh, racial de uh, <laughs> regression, discon regression decomposition whew, uh, techniques to disaggregate black white wealth gaps into portions that are attributed to group differences in student debt and otherwise and other observable characteristics um, or, or those additional factors that we included in our um, HLM models. And so this um, using this particular method allows us to ask, ask and answer the question or try to answer the question, what would the racial wealth gap look like if black youth had the same amount of debt um, or same debt levels as white youth, right? And vice versa, you can do. Um, answer both both those questions. So over the course of our study period, the wealth gap was approximately or close to $47,000. We find compositionally that racial inequalities and student loan debt account for a substantial portion of the black white wealth gap in young adulthood and is comparable in size to the contribution of a bundle of socioeconomic factors and post-secondary institutional characteristics so that comes out to like close to about forty five hundred dollars so the black uh excuse me if black young adults had the same debt burden as white young adults in our sample the racial wealth gap would decrease by about 10 point close to 10.5 percent We also looked at um, how the contribution changed over the course of that early adult from early to uh, later uh, young adulthood period. And we see that because of the growing debt disparity, the contribution of the student loan debt grows from about 13% or 13.25% of the black white wealth gap uh, to about 23% in five years. So our earlier work where we started was that, you know, black families are less able to use these economic resources to protect adult children from high debt burdens. And this analysis um, added in post-secondary institutional characteristics and credit market characteristics, along with labor market outcomes or early outcomes um, that these young adults experience upon school leaving and lead them to repay, or lead um, black young adults to repay their loans more slowly than their white counterparts. So we believe that this is providing some strong evidence in support of this idea that rising debt may be a mechanism by which racial inequalities are being reproduced 
across generations, and that they may have long-term consequences for racial inequalities in wealth and the fragility of the next generation of what we term the black middle class here defined on their post-secondary institutional, uh, post-secondary educational attainment. Okay, so um, defining middle class status based, uh, or the likelihood of being middle class um, on their ability to access higher education. We believe that black young adults are taking on a great deal more risk in pursuit of a college degree and may be re reaping fewer economic rewards, um, if we're, in particular if we're looking at um, wealth outcomes. So some may argue that this work or that we're given these debt disparities is helping to make the case that college may not necessarily be worth it or more directly, and I have been asked, are you arguing that black young adults and students should not go to college? I wanna be clear, the answer to both of these questions is no, but it does directly and potentially challenge how we assess the economic value of post-secondary education. To be clear, the anticipated returns to a college degree are still greater than those with no degree. So as you can see here in this chart that plots lifetime earnings for those, um, those with a college degree are expected to be about $1 million more than those with a high school diploma. And you know, there's a, it's a very um, noticeable gradient as one increases um, their educational attainment. And yet even among those with bachelor's or advanced degrees, lifetime earnings of black and Latinx um, graduates are at least 20% lower than those of similarly educated whites. So this is like a gap of about uh, uh, 480,000, so close to half a million dollars over the course, less uh, accumulated over the course of, of their lifetime. So it's not surprising, even despite that, though that, that despite that disparity, that post-secondary education is viewed as crucial for young adults despite the racial income disparities to improve one's socioeconomic status if you're just comparing it to those who have not um, completed their, or excuse me, have um, less than uh, a college degree. Um, but I will also say that we currently live at a time in which the message that educational attainment is one of the strongest predictors of social mobility is quite pervasive. So this, this notion or this, um, this mantra. Um, and higher education has become a defining characteristic of social mobility and in achieving what I would say is an income defined middle class status. And we make that claim in that previous paper. So that's why I'm kind of directly challenging and talking and speaking to myself in the literature, but also speaking to our broader conversations that are happening within society. Um, however, I started to think about this and, and, and say that only using an earnings base or income measure to define the economic value of post-secondary education um, may be incomplete, um, and especially if we're looking at recent cohorts of young adults. And in this era of rising family costs and the necessity of higher education. So I go on to say here um, in newer work, I think a little bit more about a wealth-based metric to define middle-class status uh, will allow us to highlight persistent inequalities within our society. In addition, it unmasks um, the economic fragility of college-educated Black young adults, as we had asserted, but not necessarily kind of shown empirically in the uh, sociology of race and ethnicity paper. So in this last piece, hopefully I'm doing okay on time. <laughs> uh, good. Okay. Uh, Wealth in the United States provides insurance against financial risk and serves as a mechanism uh, for social mobility. And it's also a means of solidifying access to social, political, economic, and educational opportunities. So wealth affords the most, I, what well, we believe that wealth affords, oops, excuse me, the most useful economic indicator of a group's, of social group status, and is far superior indicator of economic well-being than income. So we make this claim in a recent paper that was published last year, co-authored with uh, Dr. William Sandy Darity and Amari Smith, who's a wonderful graduate student at Duke University. So in new work that, I've, um, that I'm gonna talk about, I draw upon this recent collaborative collaboration in which we lay out this argument for redefining the black middle class as a subaltern group within the broader United States so why are we using this word subaltern, right? So subaltern here is used as an alternative or replacement for um, the term minority. And uh, substantively, we say that um, subaltern is understood as any person who, due to their membership in a stigmatized group, 
is assigned an inferior social status or rank, but the inferior status may not apply under all contexts or under all criteria. So, you know, here we have middle, like middle class blacks who are maybe faring financially better than the, um, the larger, greater proportion of black uh, population, but still are stigmatized within the broader United, you know, U.S. society. So, how can we visualize subalternity? Here, this uh, this uh, chart draws upon data from the Survey of Consumer Finances 2016, um, and as you can see, if you start at the very top a wealth quartile, I hope you can see my little mouse here. <laughs> um, the top the median wealth of black households, which is this yellow bar, um, excuse me, I'm gonna, uh, yes. Well, you can see the wealth differences in the in the uh, top quartile, but if you move down to the uh, fourth quartile, you see that the wealth holding sits below the, uh, the uh, median wealth of white households in the third quintile. And you can do that same pattern as you move down. So it's kind of like this ladder in which um, the uh, median wealth of the uh, white households in the lower quintile, uh, qu yeah, quintile sits uh, higher than the median wealth of Blacks and Latinx in higher quintiles. So we go on to uh, make the case that we use, need to use wealth to understand class status and the associated returns to that status, particularly among subaltern groups. And using such a definition to define middle class especially black middle class, is going to disrupt notions of higher education, social mobility, and economic security. So for this last set of analyses, I investigate this relationship between post-secondary educational attainment and middle class status and differences across uh, racial and ethnic groups. Again, drawing upon data from um, the NLS Y97 cohort. Uh, so I'm gonna look explicitly at um, outcomes of those who completed the age 30 asset module and going to use logistic regression models predicting being at least middle-class status. So what do I mean at least middle-class status? So similar, similar to what we did in the contemporary economic policy paper, uh, we use the top three wealth quantiles uh, to define being at least middle-class. So here is the, uh, the descriptives for the data uh, for the sample data from NLS 97. And so in order to qualify to be at least middle class, um, it was to have a reported net worth of uh, close uh, just over $7,900. When I disaggregate that by race and ethnicity, we see that among the white young adults, uh, about 68% of them had uh, enough net worth to qualify to be at least middle class, uh, 43% percent of the black young adults and 60, close to 62 or almost 62 percent of the Latinx young adults in the sample would have met this criteria. We also see here that there are um, that by this this asset module so by about age 30 most young adults have had some post-secondary experience so we often hear uh, stats you know about only 30 percent of you know, U.S. born adults have or hold a college degree, but I think when we look, um, uh, you know, we scrutinize the numbers a little bit more and, and look at the distribution, especially among recent cohorts of young adults, the majority of them have touched some post-secondary post experience, okay? And we can see this um, in this distribution here, right? So most young adults have had some post-secondary experience. Now, yes, the numbers, um, the you know, of completion are, are, you know, mirror those of the broader U.S. society, but we do see um, that some college number increasing um, is fairly is fairly large, uh, or by age 30, excuse me. So now I'm going to present the results from the logistic regressions that are predicting at least middle class status, um, and the reference category is going to be um, a high school degree or less. So for among all young adults, here we see. Um, that having a college degree is associated with being at least middle class. This is, um, sorry, co co coefficient plots um, and are plotting marginal effects. Um, among black young adults in the sample, I do not find that a college degree is associated with being at least middle class status. I do see that among the black young adults who had some graduate education, so this is 
either enrolled in graduate education or um, having completed graduate education, they're less likely to be middle class. Oops. Um, among white young adults, their results mirror the, uh, the aggregate figures in which having a college degree was positively associated with being at least middle class. And among the Latinx young adults, oh, sorry, again, that's relative to white young adults who have a high school degree or less. So these are within race, um, uh, uh, within race results. And among Latinx young adults, relative to a Latinx young adults who have a high school, high school degree or less, we do see, or I do find that having um, had some college education, both uh, some college and or having completed college education is positively associated with um, being at least middle class. Um, but we can also see that there's uh, the bar <laughs> or there's much variation, a larger variation um, among uh, those, mar uh, those, those estimates, excuse me. I also look at, um, you know, um, among those who have at least middle class status, we see that um, um, looking at other indicators along their household balance sheet, that black young adults in the middle class are much more likely to be economically fragile. So what do I mean? We see that if we look at their median household income status, they're about, um, you know, a little more than half that of the white middle class um, household, black young adults in the in, uh, black, middle class young adults who are in the middle class have about half the household income of those of white middle class young adults. Um, and even though we see um, there's not statistically significant differences in the debt holdings um, and their debt amounts, we see like, you know, if we do uh, relative, so um, debt to income or debt to wealth, they have higher debt burdens. Um, I also replicated this to uh, look at differences by degree completion and including wealth, again, highlights this subalternity of black college graduates. So their debt hold, excuse me, their wealth holdings falls um, well below that of both, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, the white middle class who have completed their degrees. And that also, we also see that within uh, the populations without, without a degree as well. So to summarize, um, I'll, well, before I, I, I'll summarize that past paper, that last paper just to say that black young adults in the American middle class are economically fragile. Um, we see that we also find that higher education was not associated with middle class wealth, a middle class based wealth uh, definition in young adulthood for black young adults with some um, some college education, um, and that among the middle class college graduates are more likely to have higher net wealth, um, but they're also more likely to come from wealthier families and have higher incomes. Um, and uh, black young adults have this greater student debt burden. So I'm gonna wrap up and hopefully take a lot of questions. Um, but just to conclude, um, this work I believe is important because it's centering black young adults and racial wealth inequality within the broader uh, student loan debt discussions that we're having both um, within academia, as well as within uh, uh, political, the policy realms, and in the in the media, as, as Jessica referenced, um, I think it also recognizes that student debt disparities are playing a role as a stratifier among recent cohorts of young adults in replicating, and uh, producing, and reproducing um, wealth inequalities, and um, and is identifying wealth as a critical indicator for assessing economic value of post-secondary uh, post education, um, in particular, in particularly within um, this, th this new uh, higher ed environment in which debt has become um, a, the means for financing one's education. So I'll stop there and take some questions. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Fenaba, for a really insightful and informative presentation. Um, so we'll open up to questions. If you would like to ask a question to Dr. Addo, please um, enter it in the Q&A portion of, um, of the Zoom button down there, and I will uh, read them out as they come in. Um, and I guess I can actually get things started. So I had a question. <laughs> I was actually wondering if you could 
open this up with a discussion of the policy relevance, like you were just mentioning. Um, how does your work enter into this conversation about canceling student loan debt? And how do you actually see that playing out if it were adopted as um, a policy? Wow, that's a great question, because that's all the questions I have been <laughs> kind of fielding and getting more recently around student debt cancellation, mm -hmm. uh, or around student debt and, and racial debt disparities. And you've probably seen, um, I mean, I don't think you can hide from it now, um, the push to get student debt cancellation um, to happen under the new administration. Um, because what we do know, and that, you know, especially within the um, uh, with among black borrowers that like you know like I cited independent of their degree status they're more likely to have higher debt burdens and more are, are more likely to have uh, and more more college black college students are more likely to have debt and are su are, are suffering and it's lingering you know their their trajectory of paying that debt is not just or we're seeing not just those 10 years post graduation or post completion, but are um, are much longer and many are seeing those balances increase. So I say all that to say that it's not a pretty or it's not a it's not a a, a um, it's it's not a good it's we're in crisis and I think that it needs to be addressed. And I think that one thing that we could do to address this is yes, debt cancellation is <laughs> um, but that's not the only thing that we need. We need to con we have to look at the accumulation piece as well. So um, my co-author Jason Hull and I have been advocating that we need at least a two-pronged approach to addressing the student debt crisis. One that addresses the um, the amount of debt or the the people with existing debt, as well as addressing how do we reduce um, accumulation um, in with uh, you know uh, among borrowers. So. Um, I think a, a student debt cancellation would be a recognition that there is something broken within the system um, that would allow, would, that would saddle individuals with such high debt burdens um, and making it increasingly difficult for them to, to pay back. Yeah. Um, I think there's a question here that kind of follows off of this and it's a nice extension of this conversation. Um, so, Jess Meyer says, I was also wondering about the implications of this work for the idea of baby bonds as a potential way to decrease racial wealth disparities. Yeah, so that question speaks directly to the accumulation piece that I was talking about. How can we think about increasing the resource if, you know, if we, um, if we, as, as my work kind of points out, we have this uh, wealth gap or we have, we have this resource, resource gap um, that is, um, contributing to debt accumulation. And so um, a, a program like Baby Bonds, for those, it's, it's, a, it would, it's like a trust account for um, babies. It's a, a, a universal, sorry, universal, I can't think of the word, universal trust account for um, uh, babies that are born into the United States. They'd get a set amount of money that would kind of grow with uh, the T-bill interest and that by age 18, the individual could use that money to pay for college or something like that. So kind of trying to bridge a little bit of the, the gap in wealth holdings, um, because we also know that black households are more disproportionately more likely to have, um, you know, to be low wealth or have no wealth. So it would, it would help them out even more. So yeah, that speaks directly to the accumulation, accumulation piece, um, independent of there being changes within the higher ed financing system. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question from Jonathan Konzelman, who's asked, to what extent might educational debt disparities be driven by choice of post-secondary institution? For instance, we know for-profits target certain marginalized groups and also leave their students with more debt. Yes, yes. So that is something that um, is uh, does come up in our, in our work and has come up in many uh, other people who are doing work in this space the role of um, the amount of debt that individuals who choose to go to poor profits are taking. They're also more likely uh, to enroll, both enroll black uh, students and black women in particular who have, uh, who have a large, um, who, are, who have a lot, a large debt burden, excuse me. Um, so 
I think it plays a critical role. So that was that second domain that I kind of probably went through too fast are the post-secondary institutional characteristics, one of them being for-profit status, as well as attending underfunded schools that just can't offer um, the same amount of grant-based aid that um, schools that are better funded can offer to their students and their families. Um, to follow on to that, I'm sorry, I know this is hijacking but I, I think it goes along with that. It's part of my question. <laughs> um, I wondered about the SUM college group and if you could talk about the role of non-completion, because just to follow up on Jonathan's question, I think one of the things that he's also touching upon is that some of these um, post-secondary institutions are not great at retention. And especially with the for-profit um, organizations, they are kind of not interested in whether or not you graduate, you know, they're interested in getting you signed on to take more and more credits. So um, I wondered how much non-completion is contributing to these racial disparities in debt and default in particular. And, um, you know, that seems to be like a really precarious situation to have student loan debt, but not to have a degree that could then be in the labor market, a, a signal or a, a key to a higher paying job. Yeah, so that's a critical um, important, uh, uh, piece, right? So um, that's why I spoke to when I was kind of introducing the last, uh, the last paper about the necessity of a college education within our society. So the need for this you know, um, credential <laughs> in order to secure uh, financially financial stability or financial security through labor market earnings or through income um, for those who are, you know, have just some college and no degree, not only do they not have the degree, but they also have the debt burden. So if they're more likely to experience high rates of unemployment um, or bouts of unemployment or um, income volatility, then it makes paying back, even if it's small, smaller amounts of debt, problematic. And we know that the reverberations of not paying back one's debt, um, especially if you run into issues and can't work out some kind of income-based repayment or forbearance program can really harm one's credit, um, which makes borrowing in future periods or future, you know, as you get older, more expensive. So can have very, very um, both short and long-term implications. Um, and they're more likely or uh, to happen if you, um, if you, if you, you know, if you can't pay your debt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Barbara and Whistle has asked, um, would you please comment on the role of marriage and cohabitation patterns in the wealth differences between black and white young adults? Sure. Okay. <laughs> she's, she's speaking to my other, my other I was going to say, this is right up your alley. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess, um, well, one thing I'll say is that my earliest work on this was looking at the role of student debt on um, on marriage formation among young adulthood and really finding that it was associated with a decreased likelihood of moving directly into marriage among young adults. Um, so education debt um, and was negatively associated with um, with debt for among young women in particular. And this is all has actually been replicated um, among others who have used different data sets and you know the different periods as well um, so we do see some um, evidence that there may be implications in the marriage market for um, for, for debt accumulation um, um, but we also at the same time we can't ignore the, the shifts or the, the ongoing shift in marital parent patterns um, in particular the rise of non-marital cohabitation that is was also happening at this time as well um, I, I, you know, Jessica and I are doing some work around fertility and, and wealth uh, as well. Um, and I've done work with others looking at the role of debt within relationships and really thinking about how people view, view debt um, within relationships um, and how maybe viewed differently once, especially if you take the case of student loan debt, which may have been acquired or is acquired individually, but in a marital or joint relationship union um, becomes ours. <laughs> and so that may be contributing to uh, some barriers associated with formalizing the union, um, given what may happen or the associated cost in the event of dissolution. Or um, And so I believe that those are some of the, the mechanisms that are going going on there. And I look at in other, uh, in, in 
other research <laughs> that, I, that I, I still enjoy working on as well, in addition to this work. Thank you. Yeah, so I think just to summarize, so you're seeing that um, having <laughs> student loan debt is related both to someone's um, likelihood of forming these relationships, but then also within those relationships, um, I think like uh, you had that demography paper where you showed that the wealth accumulation within marriage is lower for Black women. Is that true? Am I am I recalling this correctly? I, no. I was like, that sounds like a fascinating paper. Oh. <laughs> I shouldn't try to cite your own papers. Maybe but, we should talk about that later. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. But no, what, what I do show is in young adult co was, maybe this is what you were talking about, um, that in, in, within young adult relationships, uh, they're more, less likely to combine their uh, debt related um, mm -hmm. finances. Um, yeah and are uh, more likely to join, you know, um, towards savings. So less, you know, less likely to have joint credit cards and th those kinds of vehicles and more likely to do things that are associated with um, wealth building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, I'll, I'll stop trying to cite your own research to you. Okay, um, Elizabeth Frankenberg has a comment. She says, great talk, thanks. Um, wondering if you have any sense of what components of wealth generate the biggest gaps, i.e. housing versus savings? That's a that's a great question. So we didn't explore that in the in we explored something similar to that within the uh, within our first paper that looked at debt accumulation and is particularly looking at the household portfolios among the parents um, and finding, uh, you know, kind of speaking again to this huge wealth disparity within our society or racial wealth gap within our society, even though they are in that top wealth quintile, um, the value of their homes, the home equity was significantly lower um, and the uh, the amount of, of wealth that they held in kind of like savings, so liquid assets or, was significantly lower as well. Um, and, you know, kind of suggesting the ability to kind of have access to money that is more fungible that, you know, they could transfer onto their children may be something that's playing a role there. Um, uh, but again, this is just suggestive of what might what might be going on there. Um, there's some great research um, in the, out of econ literature. One of our former professors, Mike Lovenheim at uh, Cornell has done some work looking at how rising home equity contributed to um, differences in, in college selection um, uh, outcomes and, and finding that parents were more likely to send their children to more uh, expensive colleges or, and, and is associated with college completion as well. So there's there's some pretty strong evidence out there related to, to access to, to assets and um, the, the, the mechanism in which the wealth uh, accumulation happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I like so much about this line of research that you're working on is I think that there's also a body of sociological research that looks at racial disparities in assets specifically related to housing. And I think you're uncovering this other component of wealth that contributes to these disparities in, um, in student loans. And I, I really like that you did that decomposition to quantify how much um, student loan debt is attributing to those, you know, is, is contributing to those gaps. Okay, um, great. So Alexis Dennis says, thank you for a stellar talk. Given your focus on young adulthood, have you examined whether the student debt crisis, student repayment crisis is impacting family formation for whites versus blacks versus Hispanics? If so, what have you found? I personally have not, but I do know of a paper that was published in Demography, uh, like a couple years after my paper on marriage, that actually explicitly looks at that question. So I hate to deflect, but I'm going to deflect you to that paper. Uh, uh, and I want to say, and I hope I don't get this wrong, but one of the co-authors was a graduate student in the sociology department of UNC. Um, and I hope I'm not wrong in citing that. If, if you do, you can email me later, and, or you can email me later, and I can send you uh, send you the link of the, the site to that paper. But they do find some. Uh, evidence for uh, delays in fertility as well as um, uh, racial differences, uh, racial, um, and I think what they actually find that, uh, I, I really should not be citing off, of the, off the top of my head, but uh, black women were less likely to delay um, the timing, even though, even if, in, you know, even despite their student loan debt, I think that was one of the 
kind of novel find, or I shouldn't say not too novel, but findings that they found. Um, do you remember what what that paper was? Was it the one with um, Rachel Dwyer? I don't believe it's that one. This one was in demography. I want to. I don't want to guess. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I, you, can, you can text. You could. I can post it later if you want to. Yeah, to Alexis. We will follow up with you um, later with a link to that paper. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And Rachel Dwyer has a paper too. I'm sorry that that totally. There's a paper that also looks at by Rachel Dwyer and a, I believe one of her graduate students that also looked at that. But I'm not sure if they did a racialized analysis. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Michael Pruitt is asking a solution for continued student debt growth. I've heard floated is reducing the disincentives for serious underwriting from lenders. If lenders faced greater consequences for defaulting students and undertook more serious underwriting, are there ways this could become yet another tool for racial stratification by reducing access to credit for prospective black students? Are there good policy approaches to resolve that? So that's a great question. Um, my first thought was, well, the lender here is the United States government is for federal loans. So, um, you know, that's, so we have to separate out the private and the public uh, lending, um, but I think I'm, I'm assuming you're speaking more to the um, uh, to the private loan market um, and what what is happening there. I have to think about that a little bit more, to be honest. Um, as far as because because what we actually you know have to think about here is that in order to access private loans, you need a co-signer. So a lot of the times, it's, it becomes kind of intergenerational. So this is something else I've been looking at. Um, not only are you on your the student borrowing, but also the parent, family member, relative is also on the hook for um, for the for the loan debt as well. And we see that a lot. And actually, some of the research, uh, some of the qualitative interviews that we've done with um, with borrowers, um, and and couched in that also has been like historical legacies of credit market discrimination, um, which is actually kind of interesting if you think back historically you know we see in all other realms of debt holdings blacks tend to have lower or less debt than whites because they just they couldn't even get access so on the external margin they couldn't get access to the to the to the market um, but student loans we see you know blacks either having just as much or maybe even more um, and so there may be some uh, like i think what you're suggesting some predatoriness or something happening within the student loan market that you know, in this instance, the one time they get access to a credit market, it's done on kind of nefarious terms. So I have to, you know, I, I have to think a little bit more, I'm try, again, trying to answer your question um, on the fly, um, but thinking about ways that we can better regulate, um, you know, better re regulate the market, I think is definitely what we need to see happening. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that, but I have to, again, thinking on the fly. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And um, Nikhil Kothagal, I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm sorry, um, says, as someone who has spent many years in school, but who has made very little financially in return, have you looked at what types of degrees people are obtaining and then into what fields these people are entering for their careers? Thinking about how certain majors may be less lucrative in terms of career trajectory and contributes to prolonged debt burden. I should say, I have not looked at that, but there are many, many, many scholars who are looking at that. One of my um, colleagues and good friends, Doug Weber, is actually has done a lot of work. Um, however, they've looked, um, his outcomes are income based and earnings. Um, so, you know, I'm pushing to, <laughs> to put out there that we need to start looking at wealth based um, outcomes as well, um, given, given, given what my research is showing. So, um, yeah, I would encourage you to look up. Uh, Douglas Weber. Uh, that's W E B B E R. He does a lot of work on major and 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 the returns to the returns to college major. Yeah, great. I could see like along this line of thinking how maybe investment in medical school or law school is just an incredible debt burden up front, um, but then maybe has a higher return on investment than other potential, um, you know disciplines. I'm not going to name names here, but um, that's an interesting question. Thank you, Nikhil.
Okay. Um, so I think we're just out of time because it's one o'clock. So thank you so much, Venaba, for sharing this work with us. Thank you everyone for joining us today and for asking your excellent questions. Um, I think there was one question that we didn't get to, but I think it's something that maybe we can just um, answer by typing it out. Um, anyway, I hope that you all have a good rest of your day and we'll see you again next week. Thanks.